Hey, welcome back to my full ranking of Elden Ring bosses. Last time we looked at the awful, bad, mediocre and some decent tier fights, so trust me I'm a lot happier to be talking about the other half of the bosses, since we'll be starting off near the good tier. But before we do, I must apologize deeply for the hurt, for the pain and for the suffering I have caused when last video I ranked putrid avatars at the very bottom. I said their scarlet rot fart attacks force you away from them, but in truth they don't. You can just dodge to the side or behind them and you're good. So I lied. I betrayed the many Erdtree Avatar fans out there who trusted me to rate their favorite boss fairly and I let them down. So as an apology I promise I'll make a top 10 Erdtree Avatars in Elden Ring video at some point. Anyway, let's get back to the ranking. Last video I said Lanciax is the top decent tier boss, but now that I think about it, I just can't put Fire Giant in good. It's got the cool factor of a good tier boss, but the mechanics of a mediocre one, so I think it evens out at around decent. I think the first half of the fight is really quite boring though. Miyazaki's love for feet is at full force here, because feet is pretty much all you can see. But because this game was created by Japanese people and George R. R. Martin, it gets fucking brutal and weird in phase 2. But mechanically the second phase is still kinda mediocre. I like it thematically, and the fact that you can see most of the boss, and how its mouth works like an artillery weapon, but it's more just cool to look at than to dodge. I mean usually you won't even have to dodge, just stand near him. It does feel good to brutalize him and stab him in the eye though. It's nice to get to fight one on one against a massive giant without a storm ruler or any other bullshit gimmick. His size can at times be a detriment though, clumsy fuck. Ancient heroes are a rare case of me preferring them as just a mini-boss rather than a regular enemy. Dealing with multiple of them at once in the Zamor ruins is not my idea of fun, they're just too fast and spammy to work in groups. But when it's just you and one of these icy boys, it's a fun time. It's like a budget dancer of the Boreal Valley. They move in a sort of erratic but dance-like motions, just like the dancer would. They're not ranking too high on the good tier because they're not really memorable in any of the contexts you come across them. They're just a solid enemy, that's all. I would say pretty much the same for the Bloodhound Knights. They feel like a mix between Black Knife Assassins and Slave Knight Gale's first phase, and it takes good aspects of both. They fight like feral half-human half-animals like Gale does, but also move around as quickly and fluidly as the Black Knife Assassins. So again, nothing really bad about them, just not as memorable as some of the other bosses. I like the Dragonkin of Noxtella quite a bit for one reason. I really don't like the basic Dragonkin soldiers. I think they're just a more annoying version of trolls where they have jank hitboxes and even jankier camera, but the Noxtella version takes that mediocre boss and turns it into a good one by introducing it to frozen lightning attacks. However the hell that works. The boss also has wings now which allows it to fly up in the air and spread that ice lightning everywhere. It's easy to avoid because of how well telegraphed the danger zones are, but it's fun nonetheless. The Grave Warden Duelist is probably the most forgettable good boss in the game. Which is a shame, they could have done something cool with these guys because their moveset is kinda badass. This guy's dual wielding hammers attached to a chain which allows him to use them as sort of flail like weapons and I like that. I think it's fun seeing more unique weapons instead of everyone just being guy with sword. It also enables him to have cool attack patterns. Up close he'll just bonk you with the hammers, but if you create distance he'll change those attacks to include the chain mid combo. Also that helmet is fucking nice, I want it. This is the least stress inducing boss in Elden Ring. If anything, it's relaxing because of the music and the easiness of the mechanics. It does make it less interesting as a boss fight though. I could easily kill the boss before it gets to show any of its cool moves in phase 2, but I appreciate the fact that those cool moves do exist, like those bounces or rolling around like the smaller deer in this game do, but with the size of the ancestor spirit it's now an actual attack. I don't really care much about the boss healing itself, at best it increases the length of the fight by like 10 seconds and that's fine by me. The only mechanic I don't really like is whenever he teleports to the other side of the massive cave. Like what's the point of making me run all the way up there? It's not hard, it's just a waste of time. The Falling Star Beasts are surprisingly complex for being just field bosses of no real consequence. They have about as many mechanics as any boss in Dark Souls 3 would and more than say Regal Ancestor Spirit, even though that boss is a major remembrance boss and this isn't. I think these might share the same skeleton as the bulls in Sekiro, but if so, they're pretty much unrecognizable. 
They have hooves and a bull charge, but that's about it for similarities. Well, actually, they're both pretty much equally hated by the community. But are there really any bullshit mechanics here? No pun intended. I really don't think so. Maybe the laser being able to one-shot you is, but it's easily avoided, so, like, just don't get hit. I like that you can stop the bull charge by hitting the boss in the head while it's doing it, and it gets staggered for a while too. I like the amount of head slams and tail swipes there are, the move where the beast just trots around while trying to murder you with spiky rocks is kinda cute, and even the big fuck of AoE isn't really unfair at all. You can get out of its reach easily, and you can even iframe it and get free damage. It's a good boss. Nile is like if Nameless King retired and got lazy and fat in his old age. He too uses lightning storms and wind attacks, but instead of a dragon, he has the help of two of the most brutal night type enemies in the game. I'm usually able to dispose of them fast before they can become too much of a nuisance, but it's still definitely my least favorite part about this fight. I get he's a commander and, well, what do commanders do? They command troops. But was it really necessary to make those troops be the most aggressive, toughest knights in the whole game? But Niall himself is good. He's tanky but has super telegraphed attacks and lots of windows for you to punish. Especially after he's done his super combo, he gets exhausted and just rests there for a while and you're free to spank him all day. And I like that he's kind of a skill and damage check before you're granted access to Helic Tree. If you can't beat this guy, you're not gonna stand a chance against Melania. Renala is our first demigod on the list, aside from Soldier of Godric who appeared in the previous video. She's a really cool and unique experience when you do it the first time, and it makes you feel like the villain for having to kill these singing girls. Or you can just be a pacifist like me and punch them. But once you know what to do, it's the easiest fight in the game. But you can get through it in like half a minute, so it doesn't really take too much away from the enjoyment of replaying the boss. The fight against Rani's illusion of Renala is why I still have fun after 8 playthroughs. It's got one of the nicest aesthetics all around. I love the peaceful dark ocean and the massive full moon in the back. Her moveset is nothing to write home about, but I'd say it's enjoyable enough to engage with. But apparently for Radagon he'd rather engage with Marika. Ouch. Whenever I do this boss half the fight I'm thinking, what the fuck is going on? It's gotta be the most chaotic fight in the game, it's just a nightmare. There's curse clouds everywhere, lightning striking on the ground, every claw swipe from the boss has that delayed lightning shock, and on top of that if you go near him you'll get this sticky lightning attached to you. It can be a bit much at times when the boss spams claw swipes and you're fighting the camera as much as the boss. I do like the atmosphere the chaos helps create, it fits the music and the twisted scenery. And thankfully they've now fixed the issue where phase 2 of the soundtrack would never play. Hearing the rest of it does add to the enjoyment of the fight for me. I could see myself placing this boss higher in the future, but for now, I think I'm most comfortable with putting the Lich Dragon as the goodest of the goods. So let's move on to the Great Tier. I'm probably gonna get lynched for this placement, but fuck it. I survived from the Erdtree Avatar protest, I'll weather this storm too. No pun intended again. Placidusax is one of the coolest bosses in all of FromSoft games, but the fight is kind of a mess. It's part 2 of the whole what the fuck is happening, the boss. The camera isn't really the main issue, though it doesn't help. I just think the way the boss functions passively is clunky as hell. The hitboxes are janky at times, I think the move where the boss summons multiple lightning strikes that track you are just kind of annoying, even if they're easy to avoid. All the move does is make you take a walk. And mainly it's just how immobile the boss is. If you get behind him, he'll take 5 minutes to turn around. It's especially awkward when after some of his dive attacks he's left facing away from you and then he'll struggle to turn back around. This boss is like fighting my grandma who's got a jetpack attached to her wheelchair and she's wielding a flamethrower. But the saving grace of this boss for me is, obviously, just how fucking cool it is. From beginning to end, it's one of the most cinematic fights in all of FromSoft games and it's all done without cutscenes. Besides the intro, but that's not really even part of the fight in any way. And I do enjoy the fight whenever he starts teleporting around, that's the one way for the boss to remain mobile. I wish more of the fight included that mechanic. Okay, I know Electo might seem a little underwhelming after two giant cool dragons, but hear me out. She might not have the coolness factor, story factor, music factor or any of that, but as a fight she's just really good. She's a slightly modified Black Knife Assassin, but I already like those enemies. When I can see them. Where are you? And she has a ton more health, so I get to enjoy the fight longer. And for those pussies in Fextra Life comments complaining that she's too fast to be hit, no, she's not. What are you doing? Are we fighting the same boss? She actually has very generous openings if you aren't just trying to tank and spank. And sometimes you do have to earn those openings, and that feels rewarding. 
but I like the flow of the fight, how she's fast and agile but not too fast, regardless of what others say. And by the way, I think every boss should be balanced around like a mid-rolling greatsword user. That's the most average build and I think it would be a mistake to balance the bosses around extremes like super quick weapons or super slow ones. If you're dead set on using a colossal weapon as your only weapon and you're fat rolling, and then you complain about the enemies being too quick, well, whose fault is that? Since we have the Misbegotten Crusader, I consider it the best variant of all the Leonine Misbegotten's, meaning those guys won't be getting ranked. I never really cared for this enemy until I found the Crusader version in the depths of this cool icy cave. Not only does he have the best looking sword in the game, but the Ash of War on it makes for a cooler cell attack. This guy is one of the most aggressive enemies in the game. If you wanna heal, you've got another thing coming. He's got a few double strike moves and you won't be able to iframe both of the hits, so you need to either be close enough or far away enough to avoid getting hit. So he punishes reckless aggression and rewards good positioning. I think that's good. I know this guy isn't really a super cool lore figure with 10 phases and 5 cutscenes in the middle of the fight, but let me ask you this. If any boss in Dark Souls 1 had this moveset, do you really think it wouldn't be considered one of the best bosses in the game? This guy is such a chad, he doesn't need much health. He'll just kill you before you can kill him and that's all there is to it. I like the telekinesis sword and how he can mix its attacks with his regular combos to throw you off. He can also use it as a damn drill. It's a very simple moveset, but again with those mix-ups it's deceptively difficult. When he does his regular combos the hits are fairly quick, but if he does the telekinesis sword moves, those attacks come with abnormal delays. There isn't much to Elamer, but sometimes a well-designed simple moveset and a badass design is all you need to get into the great tier. You know, even though Astel Natural Born of the Void is the boss that gives you a remembrance, Stars of Darkness is kind of a more complete version of this boss, with a much scarier grab and the complete soundtrack instead of just the first movement. And I like where you discover this boss. Finding an alien deep under the ice will always tingle my love for the thing. The music and the visual design also add into that creepy atmosphere I always enjoy. As for the fight, it's honestly good. Back when I first ranked Astel, I didn't have a whole lot of positives to say, but I've begun to appreciate it more and more. It actually nails what Dark Eater Meteor got right more than any actual dragon boss in this game. Every attack has a punish, and despite how oddly shaped and massive the boss is, the head is pretty much all you should focus on. That's really the best way to design this kind of fight. I like how fairly telegraphed his bites are as well. Every time he's about to pinch you, he kinda snaps his jaws first. Otherwise it would probably be too hard to see the attack coming and all his other moves are just really cool looking. I don't even mind the AoE rings he can create. The ones that cover a bigger radius will have a long enough startup to let you run away, and you can always just iframe the last explosion. Plus, it's a good way to prevent the players from just hiding under the boss the whole fight. I understand now why so many people defended this boss in the comments. And I know what it might look like, that for the guy who claims his opinions are objective, I seem to change my mind a lot. But here's the thing, I don't change my mind. The boss has just become better or worse if I say so. That's how it works. Market Good is a really good boss, but man, this guy is insane for being pretty much the first main story boss. This was my asshole prior to Market, and this is my asshole after Market. I don't think the devs even realized how hard this fight is, considering Godric is way easier, and hell, even Morgoth is easier, who's just the ultimate version of this boss. It seems they thought making his hit slow would automatically make him easier, but it's actually the opposite. It's the delays we all struggle with, because just when it looks like the boss is about to hit, they then hold it and unleash it right as you're done rolling. Not only that, but there's combos that can be followed up by instant dagger strikes and you just need to memorize when he can do that. If this is your first proper FromSoft boss, I really think it's too much. Don't get me wrong, I can do the fight just fine, I've learned it, I enjoy it. For me personally, the only real downside is the music and the impact. Music is meh, there are no real stakes to the fight cause not only do you have no idea who he is by this point, but he doesn't die when you beat him. He just appears to say hello and then pieces out. I will always remember Rikard, Lord of Blasphemy. No matter how many more weird and crazy bosses they'll make, there's no way this one won't stick out in my mind for years to come. I think it's probably the best gimmick boss they've made. It's absolutely better than Yorm in every single conceivable way. Well actually, I think Yorm's soundtrack is a bit better, but when it comes to visuals, can this really be topped? I mean, the giant snake alone is pretty scary and you'd feel like a badass just for not running away from it, but, well, the second phase. Does it really even need to be said? I love this guy's voice, by the way. It's definitely the voice I would expect for a guy who just pulled out a worm-infested sword the size of a bus out of his throat. Now, let's talk about the fight itself. It's decent, that's all. 
I do really like how towards the end of the fight he'll bring back the snake from phase 1 to throw you off, but there's a bit of an imbalance with the special weapon you're given. I know, what a shock, Elden Ring unbalanced? What? But it's how the most overpowered attack on this weapon is the Ash of War on it, and you can just spam it and keep the boss stun locked. So really, all of a sudden the stat that matters the most is Mind. If you have lots of FP, you're gonna melt this guy. Again, it's weird to transition from a giant god-devouring snake into a nameless guy on a horse, but that's what happens when we mix main bosses with mini bosses. I can't just have all the main ones at the top just because they're cooler thematically. Then again, take one look at this guy and tell me he's not the coolest motherfucker you've ever seen. Draconic Tree Sentinel is the kind of reskin boss I'm completely okay with. I don't want to see a dozen Earth Tree avatars with little to no changes. Again, no offense to the Earth Tree fans out there, I know you can avoid the Scarlet Rod without running, thank you. But this guy is great. He's essentially Havel on horseback. They have massive clubs that will hit hard and reach anywhere with their shockwaves, made worse when buffed with dragon lightning. Though iframing those big slams empowered by giant lightning shocks does feel really satisfying, because you know if you mistimed it, you'd just be dead. And even the horse got an upgrade, it can now shoot fireballs at a distance, and even at close range. I would say their only downside is that you can make it a hell of a lot easier by just sticking near the shield. That way he'll only use the shield attacks and, well, they're nowhere near as scary as the club. Loretta is another really good Tree Sentinel variant, and definitely the hardest of them. Sometimes it feels a little unwarranted with how much damage she does, but if we look past that, everything else is really solid. She can't be trivialized by hiding at her shield side, she's just as deadly at range as she is up close. She's faster than the other Sentinels as well, and I just like how she's a horse riding battle mage. I've always liked the fantasy of heavily armored battle mages. That's actually how I got my name, back when I played Skyrim and made a Kashid battle mage. Fun times. Though, Loretta does also remind me of someone I'd rather not be reminded of. I should honestly just make a Miriam Roast video, I hate her so much, it warrants its own essay. Am I weird for liking the OG Tree Sentinel the best? Probably. But to me he's the perfect start to a new playthrough every time. He's the first actual boss I came across that felt beatable, unlike Grafted Scion and definitely unlike Soldier of Godric. But it did still seem pretty hard at that point, so I waited until I got the horse, so I could do a little jousting with him, and that was fun. Ever since then, whenever I make a new character, I always fight him the second I step into Limgrave, and I enjoy doing that. The guy looks badass, he's low enough to be fair even at such an early stage, even if his damage is a bit high for a fresh character. I like the shield that he can use as a weapon, it feels like you're fighting Dragon Slayer armor, but on a horse. The jump attack he does with it was when I learned that you can jump over ground slams like that. And that lesson proved very valuable later in the game. So thank you, Tree Sentinel. Also, I've excluded the Tree Sentinel duo since it's really not different from this guy. It's not really a gank even, because you can just pull one at a time. I mean, I guess the one with the torch is different, but... He, like... N no. Not worth talking about. <laughs> I love Godric. He's a near-perfect early game boss for several reasons. One reason is his difficulty. I found him pretty challenging at the time, but in comparison to late game bosses, he's a joke. If you told me right after beating him that he was easy in the grand scheme of things, I would have been shitting bricks. Another reason is that even though he is a demigod, he's like barely one. He's known for being the most pathetic of them, and yet he's still formidable in his own right. In a way that just makes you more excited, more scared of the real demigods. I also like that Margit prepares you for all the delayed attacks that Godric will also take advantage of, as does Tree Sentinel for big AoEs that you can jump over. AoEs definitely become more and more of a threat as the game progresses, and Godric is a good warm-up for that. Nowadays I find him easy, but I still like him for the music, the visual design, the cutscenes, and the voice acting. <laughs> He's like a raving, arrogant madman grasping at lost glory. But, I mean, to his credit, wielding a dragon's head as a flamethrower is pretty glorious. When I first discovered the Godskin Apostle residing at the depths of the Divine Tower of Kaelid, I was severely underleveled. But like the stubborn mule cat I am, I kept at it. And what a fucking fight it was. He spins around super fast to the point that you can't iframe all of it. Instead, you need to create distance. It's a little bit similar to how the Misbegottens function, but even more complex. But the special moves in Phase 2, well, that's a whole new problem to deal with. I've never seen a boss just stretch out like a floppy inflatable man. It's kind of funny and creepy at the same time, I like it. He has this one move where he can turn his twin blade into a propeller, and once he becomes a stretchy snake man, he can launch himself at you while spinning it away. And it feels so good to dodge through. 
Godskin Apostle by himself is a top 10 worthy boss in Elden Ring, so it's such a pity that they didn't come up with a better ultimate Godskin boss. I've been waiting for a fun innovative gank boss since Sekiro and I'm still waiting. Crucible Knights are the coolest enemies in the whole game. They're just big dick chads. Or in Salurius case, big clit I guess. So yeah, I had trouble deciding how I'd rank all the various Crucible Knights, since there's ones with spears, ones with sword and shield, but some of them have different special moves and then there's one fight where you fight two of them at once. So fuck it, I'm just putting them together, because as a whole, they are the best mini bosses in the game. The ones with sword and shield are really well telegraphed, there's no bullshit gimmicks, just a guy with a sword versus you. But it's done incredibly well. Usually in phase 2 they'll start using magical tail swipes which will alter their punishable windows but not decrease the amount of them. I'm a fan of that type of mix up. There's also one in Ferrum Azula that breathes fire instead of having a tail whip and I love that fight, even if it doesn't have a boss health bar. The spear variants kinda feel similar to Godfrey in some ways, especially how they drag the spear around and do a cute little spin. I'm not so fond of the grab though, it does stupid damage. But their projectiles and spear dives look awesome, so I forgive them. If the ultimate Crucible Knight was one that had all of their abilities, that would be so fucking sick. Instead Ordovis is pretty much the ultimate Crucible Knight boss and it's alright if you use spear dashes, but an awful gank without. The final boss of Elden Ring is as great of a great boss as a great boss can great. Not quite great enough to be amazing. Radagon is the culmination of all the game has been teaching you up to this point. Big AoEs, watch out for them. Delayed attacks, watch out for them even more. I'd say my only complaint about Radagon is how his aggression can be a bit inconsistent at times. Sometimes he's, you know, pretty chill, not too bad. Other times I think he needs anger management therapy. Like, oh my fucking god, this guy is going apeshit, calm the fuck down, dude. Then we get to Elden Beast and, oh boy, you guys don't like it at all. Lots of comments were asking me why this thing didn't appear in the previous video near the bottom of the ranking. Well, that's partially because he's tied to the same fight as Radagon, but even on his own, I do think Elden Beast is decent. Like many of you, I don't enjoy when he becomes evasive and you just have to run after him. I also used to despise the chasing star attack, but I'm pretty sure they've nerfed it now. They patched the game recently and now it seems to be a lot easier to evade. So when the boss doesn't run away too much, we've got ourselves a solid boss. Cool as shit looking attacks, beautiful music, and thematically, the perfect end boss. Now if they had designed this boss around Torrent, it could have been amazing. That would solve the issue of chasing after the boss, and I could imagine just jumping over the Elden Beast's projectiles and how fun that could be. Maliketh is amazing, and it's not even close to being excluded from the tier. I'd say it's about middle of the tier if we included all from soft bosses. Not gonna lie though, the beast clergyman used to piss me off. It seemed nigh impossible to get any reliable openings, and some attacks just came at lightning speed and I couldn't even react before I was already hit. But upon learning all of it, it's good. Sometimes you have to wait a little bit until there's a safe opening, but they do exist. I would like it to be a little bit shorter though, in favor of the black blade phase. Not because it's bad, but because the rest of the fight is too good to be so short. Again, I could swear it was impossible to hit him at first, and yet now I'd say he has some of the most fair openings for windows in the game. No matter how slow your weapon is, you'll be able to hit him, trust me. But I love the fight for how much they emphasize positioning all throughout. If you always respond to his regular combos by trying to get in close, you'll never get hit by his deadliest attack, the big flurry. Your positioning can also alter his combos, like when he pogos on his sword and does the little explosion. If you're behind him, he'll jump backwards and you should be able to hit him after that. But if you're in front of him, he'll do a flip and the flurry. I love that shit. Melania, Blade of Mikela, the most divisive boss in Elden Ring, as well as the hardest, is in my opinion close to being the best boss they've made. But you know it, I know it, everyone knows it, the waterfowl move is a big piece of shit. I have been able to avoid it at point blank range as well as at distance, but it's still the one attack in this fight that's miles harder than any other mechanic and it's at the point where I'd say it's unreasonable to expect players to avoid it at close range. You have to like awkwardly try to circle sprint around her, tricking her AI, and then dodging at the precise millisecond in the right direction, and you need to calculate exactly where she'll be, and it's just too much. 
It is reasonable to dodge the attack at a distance, but if she starts the attack when you're near, you won't be able to get out in time. So the only reliable way to dodge it that way is to be a lot more passive, and I don't like that. But I don't want to spend all this segment talking about that one mechanic, when every other mechanic is pretty fucking perfect. She manages to be as fast as a Sekiro boss, but still doable with Elden Ring gameplay, even if you're using colossal weapons. That to me is really impressive. I wish phase 1 was a little shorter and phase 2 longer, because that's when the fight is at its peak. It has more coolness factor, the music is great, I love the variety and combo finishers. A lot of her moves will now end with her flying up in the air before slamming down, creating a little butterfly explosion. I know lots of people thought she should be much lower on the list because they found her extremely frustrating and I get that. I don't really think her lifesteal does anything good for the fight, personally. It just makes it more annoying when you're trying to beat her for the first time, and after learning it, it's just something you can ignore. All it does is punish you more if you're already struggling. So I did dislike her at first when I was at that stage, but now that I've learned her to the point that I've done it without taking damage, fuck me, it's a lot of fun. I think Radan is the most innovative boss in Elden Ring. This guy couldn't exist in any of the other games. It's clearly designed around being able to use a horse and being able to jump. Some of the others just feel like regular Dark Souls 3 bosses, so I'm happy with Radan making the best use of all the new mechanics. Personally, I never summoned the story NPCs for this fight. I just think it makes it a bit too easy for me, especially since he did get nerfed some time ago. But it still was awesome when first playthrough, me and the boys just charge into battle against this hulking monster man. Even his favorite element, gravity, is completely unique to Elden Ring. After Dark Souls 3 I did get a little tired of everyone having flaming swords, and I like that Radan can be fought just as well on horseback as on foot. His second phase I wish lasted forever. It's the coolest fight in the game. I love jumping over his gravity waves or iframing the whirly tornado-ish move. Since it's such a cinematic boss I wish the music fit in equally as well. It's just not as out there and loud as I'd want it to be. I love the last, like, 40 seconds of the song, but the boss is always dead before we get there, unless I intentionally drag it out, which I do sometimes do because I love this fight so much. Morgoth was my number one in the original ranking, and I don't really regret it. He absolutely was the most enjoyable boss for the first few playthroughs. Some did find the placement questionable for one of two reasons. Either they thought the boss was too easy to be the best, or they thought the boss was just super spammy and you could never hit him before he'd start another chain of combos. First point I agree with and that's why he's not number one this time around. I find him decently well balanced for some weapons like greatswords, but pretty much anything else will make him too easy. Especially katanas, faster weapons, or anything with bleed. With quicker weapons, you can get hits in on him while he's charging up his attacks, so even if it wasn't for bleed, he'd still go down fast. But people that say he's too spammy and has no punishable windows... Well, that's just called being wrong. He has some super quick combos he can do as a follow-up, like whenever he slams his hammer to the ground. If you're close to him when he does that, he'll usually follow it up with the double sword combo. But here's an idea. If you don't want him to do it, don't dodge into him. There you go. Problem solved. I like that about him, how you can control his patterns with positioning. And I just think the moveset is incredible. They're super fun combos, like, look at this. How can you not enjoy this? There's nothing I would really change about it. It's perfect. It's just his health and resistances that I wish were different. I also adore this guy's voice acting. Every line from him is fire. Thy kind are all of a piece. If there's one boss I want to get the same treatment as the inner bosses in Sekiro, it's gotta be Mark. He's so close to being the best boss they've ever made. Just give him like a few more really cool moves and then he would be. The start of the fight is really nothing special, just a warm-up. Though if you do want to kill him as quickly as possible, you can get some enjoyment out of this part too. You can go in for heavy hits whenever he counts in Ladin, and if you have a bleed weapon, you can almost completely skip phase 2. Yeah, I wish the Lord of Blood wasn't so weak to blood loss. And why would I ever want to skip phase 2? It's addictingly good. He has pretty simple attack patterns, but each of his trident swings will spread flaming blood around which does two things. One is that it punishes you if you're not being aggressive and sticking close to him, and another is that if you do stick close, you now have to try to visualize in your mind roughly where that flaming blood will be so you won't step in it. Some will probably find that annoying, but I find it adds a lot. It makes positioning once again matter, and you've probably noticed by now, I'm into that. In my first video I complained about the arena, and that does still apply a little bit. It's mostly fine except for the stairs. I don't like fighting him on the stairs. Other than that, the fight is fucking flawless. 
I love the music, I love the blood fire explosions, I love the giant crow wings. They also actually make the move where he summons raining blood punishable since you can just safely hit the wings while he's doing that. Brilliant fight. Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, aka Horalu. You've been hearing about this guy all game, and you even get a glimpse of him on your first visit to Dell. He's a fabled hero, someone everyone looks up to, and then you fight him, in his full wits, at his full strength. Although he is being held back from his true savage self at first, thanks to the giant lion hanging off his back. Apparently that's holding back his bloodthirst. But as you fight him in his first phase, it feels like you're fighting a noble warrior. He even compliments you on a battle well fought if you lose. And it's deceptively easy to lose in this part of the fight. He has pretty slow attacks, but some of his follow-ups can come unexpectedly, so you have to match his methodical style of fighting and just study his moves and go for safe punishes. I like his AoE buff he gains halfway through as well, because you already know the timings to his attacks, now he's just putting all that you learned to the test. I do wish you couldn't damage him while he was buffing though, I can often just end the phase by the time he's done doing that. But as you all know by now, at half health, he rips himself free of the restraints of being a noble Elden Lord and becomes the ruthless, bloodthirsty Hora Lu. Now, I must say, his voice acting or dialogue or both are just a bit off to me. Long and hard didst thou fight. Warrior! It doesn't ruin the fight or the cutscenes, but it's no Morgoth, I'll just say that. But Hora Lu, the fight, is just a perfect change of pace from the first half. Fuck nobility. Fuck weapons, he just ditches all of that and goes in for the kill. And he's good at that. It's no longer a dodge and punish type of fight, but the kind where you have to run around, mind your positioning, try to strafe behind him, watch out for roll catch moves. And he does the same buff as in phase 2, which again just ups the challenge in a fair way. To this day, after however many times I've beaten him, he can still catch me off guard. I love the sheer brutality, the animations on his attacks, on his grabs, on his kills. And the drop kick, oh my god, that move is sick. I do kind of wish we'd gotten a fight where you battle both him and the lion, and they had like synchronized moves, kind of like Pontiff in Dark Souls 3. But I'm more than happy with what we got with Horalu. I think he deserves the title of best boss in Elden Ring. And you know what? A crown is warranted with strength. So that's the full ish ranking of all ish bosses in Elden Ring. Let me know just how mad I made you, because I know I did. But remember, I'm right. Keep that in mind and I'm sure we can have a civil conversation down in the comments. Before we end, I want to give my overall opinion on the game's boss quality and how it compares. If we look at the entire roster, there's probably more bad bosses than in any other FromSoft game, even Dark Souls 2. But if we only look at the main bosses, the bosses that drop remembrances, well then it's got the best boss quality in the series. Fire Giant was the lowest remembrance boss and even he was in decent tier. As for Godfrey, is he my favorite fight in the series? Probably not. I think Inner Father from Sekiro might still be the best one they've made in my opinion, but we'll see how time changes that. Next time I might make a video sharing my overall thoughts on the game, or maybe top 10 Earth Tree avatars. Yay. Thanks for watching though, I love you.